Hi guys, it is Miss Holly over here and I am here for National Library Week story time. This week is actually our national week for libraries. So I'm going to do a special story time that is just about libraries and books. Um, and I figure let's get started with a welcome song to the theme of the more we get together. So we'll sing that first and then I'll start singing the library version. So let's get started. And there should be lyrics and all sorts of things in this interactive slide right below the video if you want to follow along with the words. But let's let's get started. The more we get together, 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 the more we get together, the happier we'll be. Cause your friends are my friends and my friends are your friends. The more we get together, the happier we'll be. All right, on to the library version. The more we read together, 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 the more we read together, the happier we'll be. Read big books and small books and short books and tall books. The more we read together, the happier we'll be. Okay, so the first book we are going to read is Miss Moore Thought Otherwise, and it is by Jan Pinborough, and it was illustrated by Debbie Atwell. Now, this is about one of the very first children's librarians in the entire country, because once upon a time in America, children could not take home books from the library. They could not even walk into the library. That was not allowed, because back then, adults thought that children would ruin the library books with their dirty hands. Her children would never remember to bring library books back. And reading wasn't very important for children, especially not girls. But Miss Moore thought otherwise. So let's get started. Once in a big house in Limerick, Maine, there lived a little girl named Annie Carol Moore. She had large gray eyes, seven older brothers, and ideas of her own. In the 1870s, many people thought a girl should stay inside and do quiet things, such as sewing and embroidery. But Annie thought otherwise. She preferred taking wild toboggan rides from the cemetery all the way down past Main Street, or bouncing along in Father's buggy to the sound of Pocahontas's clip-clobbing hooves. Pocahontas is her horse. Through the trees, Annie could glimpse the White Mountains far away in the distance. She dreamed about the world that lay beyond, and about what she would do someday. Annie loved the stories and poems Father read aloud to her after dinner. On rainy afternoons, she would climb up to the attic to look at a children's magazine called Saint Nicholas. In those days, children weren't allowed to go inside libraries. People didn't think reading was very important for children, especially girls. When Annie turned 19, many girls her age were already married. Back then, an unmarried girl like Annie might keep a house for her parents, or perhaps become a teacher or a missionary. But Annie thought otherwise. She decided to become a lawyer, like her father, and day after day, she went to his law office to learn how. Then, in one terrible week, Annie's parents both died from the flu. When her brother's wife died too, Annie stayed home to take care of her two little nieces. Venturing beyond the White Mountains would have to wait. After several years, her brother married again and Annie heard exciting news. Libraries were hiring women as librarians. Annie packed her bags and traveled to Brooklyn, New York to enroll in the Pratt Institute Library School. New York was a big city. Some people thought it was a dangerous place for a young woman to live on her own. But Annie thought otherwise. She loved walking along its cobble, busy, stone, <laughs> busy cobblestone streets, going to the circus and opera and riding in a horse-drawn car across the great Brooklyn Bridge. Annie studied hard. She graduated from library school and got her first job at a, as a librarian at the Pratt Free Library. 
Some libraries were be beginning to let children come inside, but Annie's library had something brand new, a library room planned just for children. Children could come in and take the books off the shelves, and in the evenings, Annie read aloud to them, just as her father had read aloud to her. Word spread about Annie's library until one day, a man named Dr. Bostwick asked her to be in charge of all the children's sections in the 36 branches of the New York Public Library. Miss Moore dressed in her finest hat and suit and visited each library from Harlem to Chatham Square. She saw that many librarians did not let children touch the books for fear that they would smudge the pages or break the spines. They thought if children were allowed to take books home, they would surely forget to bring them back. But Miss Moore thought otherwise. She trusted children, so she created a big black book with this pledge inside. When I write my name in this book, I promise to take good care of the book I use at home and in the library and to obey the rules of the library. Ms. Moore persuaded the librarians to use this pledge so all the children of New York could check out books and take them home. Ms. Moore pushed for other changes too. She urged the librarians to take down the silence signs and spend time talking with children and telling them stories. She pulled dull books off the shelves and replaced them with exciting ones, such as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Swiss Family Robinson. She wrote book reviews and made book lists to help parents, librarians, and teachers find good books for children, and to encourage book publishers to publish better children's books. But many libraries still kept children's books locked in cabinets or tucked away in the corners. They did not have enough books for children or enough shelves to put them on. So when it was announced that a grand new library would be built on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street, Miss Moore was determined to make its new central children's room the best it could be for all the children of New York. Ms. Moore had child-sized tables and chairs specifically made. She chose beautiful pictures by N.C. Weath and other artists to hang on the walls. For the floors, she found rosy pink tiles from Wales. And she gathered collections of shells and butterflies to display. Then she filled the shelves with the very best children's books that she could find. Finally, one warm spring day in 1911, the huge bronze doors of the New York Public Library swung open for the very first time. Crowds lined the streets as a police escort brought the President of the United States, William Howard Taft, to dedicate the magnificent new library. When the library opened to the public the next day, the children of New York City walked through their own special entrance into the new children's room. Hundreds of new children's books in many languages waited within reach, and beneath every window, a cozy window seat waited for children to curl up in it. From then on, every day seemed to hold a new surprise in the children's room. Miss Moore organized reading clubs and invited musicians, storytellers, and famous authors like Dr. Seuss to entertain the children. Often, Miss Moore would reach into her handbag and pull out a wooden doll named Nicholas Knickerbocker. Children who were just learning English felt less shy about talking to Nicholas when he was around. One day, the King and Queen of Belgium visited the New York Public Library. You must come see the children's room, Miss Moore told the Queen. That day, all the children in the library, from the richest to the poorest, shook hands with a king and a queen. Outside the library walls, two world wars, epidemics, and the Great Depression came and went. But inside, the children's room was always warm and bright, a place where children could meet other children and learn interesting things. 
In big cities and small towns across America, more and more libraries began to copy Miss Moore's central children's room. So did libraries in England, France, Belgium, Sweden, Russia, India, and Japan. When Miss Moore turned 70 years old, it was time for her to retire. Some people thought she would sit quietly at home, but Miss Moore thought otherwise, of course. Her friends at the library gave her a set of luggage with a small green suitcase for Nicholas. And she traveled across the country teaching more people how to make good libraries for children. Today, libraries across America have thousands of books for children. And thanks to the help of a little girl from Limerick, Maine, who had ideas of her own, any child can choose a book from the library shelf, curl up in a comfortable seat to look at it, and then take it home to read. And that is the end of Miss Moore, thought otherwise. But you might have recognized some of the authors mentioned in the book, such as Dr. Seuss. Um, so I was just going to show you some of the other books that Miss Moore kind of made famous and popular through her librarian influence. We have Beatrix Potter here, I'm sure. Can you see it? It's kind of shiny, it's hard to see, but I'm sure you know about Beatrix Potter and Peter Rabbit. That is a pretty classic children's book. And then we have Charlotte's Web and Evie White also wrote Stuart Little, if you're familiar with that book. And like we said in the book, we have Dr. Seuss. Miss Moore made, made him pretty popular. Lois Lenski, I'm not sure if you've heard of Lois, not as popular as Dr. Seuss, but still a popular children's author. And then we have Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown. She was good friends with Miss Moore. So that is about Miss Anne Carol Moore, America's first children's librarian. All right, so now we're gonna do a flannel story and it is called, I Like Books. It is by Anthony Brown. So let's get started. I like books. I like funny books and I like scary books. I like fairy tales and nursery rhymes. What other types of books are there? Comic books, I like those too. And coloring books. There's not enough space. So let's take some of these guys down. What other types of books? Fat books, thin books, books about dinosaurs. I know those are popular, <laughs> but also books about monsters. Counting books and alphabet books. Books about space. What about books about pirates? That's all our space again. Take all these guys down. What other types of books do we have? We have song books. I like song books. But also strange books. Look at that, there's a shark swimming through the book. Yes, I really do like books. All right, so this book is about a different type of librarian from Miss Moore. It is about a librarian who has a donkey that he rides on. It is called Waiting for the Biblio Burrow, and it is by Monica Brown, and the art was done by John Para. On a hill behind a tree, there is a house. In the house, there is a bed, and on the bed, there is a little girl named Anna, fast asleep, dreaming about the world outside beyond the hill. When Anna wakes up to the rooster's query, 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 Papa is already at work on the farm and Mommy is busy in the garden. Anna bathes her little brother and feeds the goats and collects the eggs to sell at the market. After breakfast, Anna and her mother walk down the hill. 
Anna closes her eyes against the sun and wishes she was back in the cool of the house with her libro, her book. Anna has read her book, her only book, so many times. She knows it by heart. The book was a gift from her teacher for working so hard on reading and writing. But last fall, her teacher moved far away, and now there is no one to teach Anna and the other children in her village. So at night on her bed in the house on the hill, Anna makes, her up, makes up her own cuentos and tells the stories to her little brother to help him fall asleep. She tells him stories about make-believe creatures that live in the forest and the mountains and in the sea. She wishes for new stories to read, but her teacher with the books has gone away. One morning, Anna wakes up to the sounds of tack, 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 clip, clap, and a loud ea, ea. When Anna looks down the hill below her house, she sees a man with a sign that reads Biblio Burrow. With the man, there are two burrows. What are they carrying? Libros, books. Anna runs down the hill to the man with a sign and the burrows and the books. Other children run to him too, skipping down hills and stomping through the fields. Who are you? Who are they? The children ask. The man says, I am a librarian, a biblioticario, and these are my burrows, Alpha and Beto. Welcome to the Biblio Burrow, my biblioteca. But Senor, Anna says, I thought libraries were only in big cities and buildings. Not this one, says the librarian. This is a moving library. Then he spreads out his books and invites the children to join him under a tree. Once upon a time, the librarian begins, sharing the story of an elephant who swings from a spider's web. He reads books with beautiful pictures, then helps the little ones learn their ABCs. He sings A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Finally, he says, now it's your turn. Pick out books and in a few weeks, I will be back to collect them and bring you new ones. Me too, asks Anna. Especially you, says the librarian with a smile. So many cuentos. While Alpha and Beto chomp the sweet grass under the tree, Anna picks up book after book and finds pink dolphins and blue butterflies, castles and fairies, talking lions and magic carpets. Someone should write a story about your burrows, Anna tells the librarian, rubbing Alpha's nose and feeding more grass to Beto. Why don't you, he asks. Then he packs up the books and is off. Enjoy, he calls to the children. I will be back. Anna runs up the hill to her house, hugging the books to her chest. She can't wait to share her books with her brother, and that night she reads until she can't keep her eyes open any longer. Each morning, Anna does her chores and reads and looks out her window. She listens for the sounds of Alpha and Beta, but weeks pass and the librarian doesn't return. When will he come back? She asks her mother, who smiles and says, go read, Anna. When will he come back? She asks her mother, who smiles and says, go draw, Anna. When will he come back? She asks her mother, who smiles and says, go write, Anna. And when will he come back? She asks her mother, who finally says, go to bed, Anna. One night, Anna dreams she is flying over her country on a butterfly's back. In her dream, she crosses mountains and oceans and rivers and jungles, bringing stories everywhere she goes. Stories fly from her mouth and fingers like magic, falling into the hands of the children waiting below. When Anna wakes up, she misses Alpha and Beto and the Biblio Burroughs books. She remembers that the librarian told her she could write a book. And so, with paper and string and colored pencils, she does. Finally, just when Anna thinks she'll never see the Biblio Burrow ever again, she wakes up to ea, ea, and the children yelling. 
She runs down the hill with her library books and a special surprise of her very own. I wrote this cuento for you, she says. Que bueno, the librarian says, and then he reads her story to the children under the tree. When it's time to go, Anna's book is packed carefully on the burrow's back, ready to be carried away over the hills and through the fields to another child who is asleep on a bed in a house on a hill behind a tree, dreaming of Alpha and Beto and all the new stories the Biblioboro will bring. And that is the end of Waiting for the Biblioboro. This is just a little rhyme called Let's Take a Look at This Book. So we're going to use Good Night Moon, but we're not going to read the whole book. We're just going to use it as a prop. Let's take a look at this book. Here is the cover. We open it wide. Here are the pages hidden inside. There are words and pictures. We look and we look. And when we are finished, we close up the book. All right, so this next book is called Dewey, There's a Cat in the Library, and it is by Vicki Myron and Brett Witter, illustrated by Steve James, and it is actually a true story about a real library cat from the Spencer Public Library in Iowa. So let's read about Dewey. Every night, people left books in the return box of the library in the small town of Spencer, Iowa. Funny books, big books, truck books, and pig books, they left them all. But one night, on the coldest night of the year, someone left a tiny surprise. A kitty. When Vicky the librarian found him the next morning, the kitten was cold and scared and very, very dirty. Vicky took one look and decided to give him a warm bath. The kitten went into the sink brown and crying, but he came out orange and purring. I am going to keep you, said Vicky, who already loved him. We'll name you Dewey Read More Books. You can live here and be our library cat. But Dewey had no idea what it meant to be a library cat. So he did what all kittens do, he played. He lounged on the newspaper, rode the book cart, and knocked pens onto the floor. He goofed around with Marty Mouse, snooped in every open drawer, and always found at least one rubber band. But what do we love most of all was people. Tall ones, round ones, quiet ones, loud ones. The little ones, however, surprised him. And not always in a good way. Look, Nathan, said his mommy, there's a cat in the library. Nathan bent down and said, hi, hooey dooey yooks. No, said his sister, Hannah, it's Dewey read more books. Dewey squirmed, the boy was petting him in the wrong direction. Dewey loved to be petted, but he hated being petted in the wrong direction. Dewey was licking his fur back into place when he heard a strange noise. Wah! Dewey's ears perked up. He looked around. Wah! Wah! Dewey sprang to action and crept really slowly toward the sound. Surprise! The little people, Dewey discovered, came in tiny sizes too. And they loved to giggle and grab and pull and coo. Babies are wonderful, Dewey thought. Cute and smellicious too. A few days later, Dewey went exploring and discovered in a secret room the most exciting thing he had ever seen, children's story hour. Wowsy whiskers, this looks fun, Dewey thought as he pushed into the room with his nose. Someone shouted, there's a cat in the library. Dewey froze. It was quiet for one minute. Then everything went wild. And the next thing Dewey knew, he was being carried upside down. Oh my, Dewey thought, what should I do now? 
Late that night, Dewey talked to his friend, Marty Mouse. The library is a wonderful place, Dewey said, but I'm tired of being pulled and poked and carried upside down. I'm not just a cat in a library, I'm a library cat. A library cat helps people, I think, and I'm 92 per 92% convinced that that's the reason I'm around. Marty Mouse didn't say anything. I'm gonna do it, Dewey said, I'm gonna help people. And he felt so happy that he threw Marty Mouse in the air, kicked him with his back legs and slept on him like a pillow. The next morning, when the very first people arrived, Dewey was waiting to greet them right by the front door. All morning, Dewey acted like a library cat. He read with the mommies and grandmas, he helped the daddies work. He even shelved books with the library clerk. When he saw little Nathan, he turned a circle and a half so the boy could pet his back from his head down to his tail the right way. And I'm glad we're friends, Dewey, Nathan said. Dewey smiled at that. By lunchtime, Dewey was worn out. So he found a good box. First, he put his front paws inside and then his belly. He squished his way back and down, wiggled around until he was all the way in and closed his eyes. There's an orange muffin in the library, a little girl giggled. But just as Dewey was about to drift off into sweet kitten dreams, he heard a heavy sigh. His eyes popped open and he saw a girl on the other side of the library a sad little girl reading very quietly all by herself. He climbed up close and stared at her. She was looking the other way. He sniffed her hand. She wouldn't play. He knocked her mittens to the floor. She let them stay. Then he saw her jacket and had his best idea yet. Silly always works. I'll be a silly cat today. The girl stared at Dewey. You look like a fuzzy hot dog in a purple bun, she said. And then she surprised him. She laughed right out loud. I love you, Dewey. Read more books, the girl whispered as Dewey nestled into her lap and began to purr. This is it, Dewey thought. I'm a real library cat and this feels great. No, it felt better than great. It felt. Perfect. And that is the end of Dewey, There's a Cat in the Library. So this is a silly book about the not so quiet library and it is by Zechariah Ahura. So let's learn about this silly library. Every Saturday, Oscar and Theodore got up bright and early not to watch cartoons or play outside with their friends. It was the day they went. Where do you think they're gonna go? To the library with dad. Dad always said that a day of quiet exploration required a proper breakfast. At the library, Theodore and Oscar returned their old books, waved to Miss Watson and crept past old pickled onion, Mr. Tasker. They headed down to the children's department while dad headed up to the nap department. Oscar and Theodore were just getting settled into another quiet library day when boom, crash, growl. Shh, knock it off, Theodore. Boom, crash, growl. It's not me. It appeared there was a monster in the library. There's a monster in the library. I told you it wasn't me. They couldn't outrun the monster, so they tried hiding. You better not mess with us, Mr. Monster. My brother knows Kung Fu. Yeah, right, and bluffing. They even tried trapping the monster, but that just made him angrier. The only option left was diplomacy. 
Excuse me, Mr. Monster, is there something wrong? Yeah, there's something wrong. We hate books. The many-headed monster had tried everything to make the books taste good. Seymour topped his with whipped cream. Chuck tried mustard. Winston swallowed his book whole. And Pat tried hot sauce. Bob used sprinkles, but they just bounced off. Actually, books are for reading. What? You mean this whole restaurant is filled with things we can't eat? Well, we'll just have to eat you guys instead. Grab the sprinkles, Winston. Finally! Wait, that's when Theodore remembered something. Donuts, of course. Perfect, you guys will taste great with donuts on top. Yum, yum. Thankfully, Miss Watson stepped in. Story time, everyone. Please sit crisscross applesauce. Applesauce, I like applesauce. Mm, story time, sounds tasty. Sorry about the whole gonna eat you thing. That was just the low blood sugar talking. I don't know what's better, this book or this donut. Books sound so much better than they taste. Luckily, monsters like story time just as much as they like donuts. After story time, the monster promised to clean up the library. Besides, Miss Watson could really use some help reaching the high shelves. The boys promised to return for story time every Saturday, after Bob, Seymour, Winston, Pat, and Chuck promised not to eat them. And that's how the not-so-quiet library became quiet again. Now he asks, how did you know that monsters love donuts? He says, I read it in a book. Perhaps it was this book. <laughs> and that is the end of the Not-So-Quiet Library. All right, so that is it for National Library Week story time. But let's sing a goodbye song together. Now it's time to say goodbye, say goodbye, say goodbye. Now it's time to say goodbye. I'll see you all next week. And I will see you next week for Ramadan story time online on a video on YouTube. See you next week, guys.